Amen. Happy New Year. What a great way to start the new year. Amen. Worshiping the Lord, being in church on Sunday. Welcome to the service. Hope you came with a heart of expectation. Today we'll be receiving uh, the Lord's Supper, communion together, and I want to invite you to participate in that with us. We do not practice at our, at our church and fellowship what is known as closed fellowship. That means that for churches that practice that, that if you're not an immediate member of their church, then uh, you can't be participating. But we welcome all who are part of the family of God, all of you who confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, to join with us in communion today as we have, we have something to gather around and celebrate, and that's the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen? And I can't think of a better way to begin the year than for us to just focus our attention on the cross and the, and the Lord and His sacrifice for our sins and to spend the time just taking this day the first day of the year to set it off on the right pace. Jesus is Lord in charge of all things in our life. So I'm going to ask you right now, I don't know what baggage you brought in, but I'm sure we all had some, amen? Especially you, Crystal. No. <laughs> Just joke. She puts up with that every day of the week in the office. So. Take it. Just set it aside. And the base, best place to set it aside to is, is where it should be, right on the altar of God. Just set it there before the Lord and say, you're in charge. And let's just do what the Lord tells us to do and remember him. This is a day we want to just set our heart, our mind, our attention, our affection, our passion, just on the Lord Jesus Christ and remember, as he said, remember me. So I want to share a few things about today and the Lord's Supper and communion and what this represents to us as most of us are familiar with, but I really think it's important that we take a moment you know, to reflect for a moment here. Just about every mention of communion in the scripture and uh, every mention of the Lord's Supper, uh, the term covenant is used. And there's an interesting thing where Jesus sets it forth and he says, you know, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And as we talk about what the Lord has done for us today and remember the sacrifice that he gave for us, let's remember that this, this is a covenant meal. This is, this is all about a covenant relationship. A covenant, if you're not familiar with it, is a, it's a pledge, a guaranteed agreement based upon trust and solemn vows and solemn pacts that parties would make together. Covenants were arranged by, by mutual consent between the two parties. They, they go much deeper and much farther than just some kind of contractual agreement. This goes into solemn oaths and promises. In some translations of, of scriptures, these are referred to as, as testaments. But one thing you might not know that the word covenant, in the, the original language as it's given to us in the Hebrew, it has to do really with covering something. It has to mean that, that, that it provides shelter, it provides protection, it pro provides assistance. And in other words, if we go out to eat and I cover the bill, guess what? I just paid for it, all right? This has to do with the whole idea of covering something and, and it, the idea that under Jesus and our relationship with him, that our, we're covered. You've heard that before, I got your back. You're covered. That's, this is ultimately what a covenant means. You don't have to worry. You know, God's got your back. He's covered you. And you may experience some of the most difficult ordeals that you think possible for the human to take, to deal with in your situations in life. But hey, he's got your back. You're covered. And listen to that, what, what, what the Apostle Paul said, just a kind of reflection as he thinks. He said, listen, if God gave up his own son for you, do you not think that he would cover every other issue of your life? You know, if he's invested into you that much, don't you think he knows what's going on is, is, and cares and is committed to you? You're under a covenant relationship, and this covenant means that a binding commitment has been made on, on your behalf between you and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, so he's, he's got your back and he's got you covered. In fact, the very co first covenant is found in Genesis, and it's when... Adam has been deceived and willfully he and Eve have chosen against the Lord's will and done what they wanted to do over and against what God wanted them to do. And remember how that God comes into the garden and restores them and an, uh, an animal is sacrificed. They're covered with skins. And God makes a covenant at that point where that he's going to put enmity between, between man and, and the serpent, the lying serpent there, and he's going to deal with, 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 with the enemy. And he's going to crush his head, in which we saw at the cross that Jesus' you know, foot was bruised. He suffered, but he 
crushed the serpent's head. His victory over our life has been dismantled. So we're, we are free. But there's another covenant that's given to us in Scripture that after, after the flood, God made covenant with, with Noah in Genesis 8. Also with Abraham, which most people are most familiar with in Genesis 15. When God makes a, a promise that he would become the father, uh, that Abraham would become the father of a chosen people, which comes out of Abraham as the nation of Israel. And so this covenant we see that God made with Abraham is fulfilled. Again, after the children of Israel leave Egypt, he meets them at Mount Sinai and he reaffirms at Sinai the covenant that he's made. And he makes his covenant with Moses and the nation and says, I will preserve you. And in all these situations, remember, even in your situation, it is God that initiated the covenant on behalf of those people. In the upper room, Jesus is gathered with his disciples. And remember, he's been going on in the Gospel of John for several chapters as they're making their way to the upper room and then later to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's the last day of Jesus with the disciples. And as they're gathering there in the upper room, he tells them, I have desired to have this Passover with you. Now, this Passover, he celebrated the Passover with him. This is the third one he celebrated with them. This one is the last one that he will celebrate with them. And out of that meal, that Passover meal, remember that we call it the Seder was there. And uh, everything in that Passover meal was given to them, you know, at, at, the, at the Exodus when they're getting ready to be released from the, <coughs> excuse me, from the bondage of the Egyptians. And a table is set. And everything on that table has some kind of... Uh, uh, symbolism. There's the boiled egg for hardship and the bitter herbs for the, <coughs> excuse me, the slavery they were going through. But every aspect of it has some meaning. And Jesus, as he gets to the end of the Passover meal, <coughs> excuse me, something's trying to torture me. As he gets to the end of the Passover meal, he relates to his disciple he take, by taking two elements out of the, the Passover. He takes the bread excuse me, again, and he takes the cup. And as he brings them before the disciples, he institutes what we know is the Lord's Supper. And remember, it comes from those Passover meals, and it's, it's referring again to, to a covenant that was made with the children of Israel about a new covenant that would later be made. And he takes these symbolic things out of the, the, of the meal. He brings them before the disciples and has them share with him. Now, everything on that Passover table referred back to the time of the bondage that they were released from when they were in captivity and slavery to the Egyptians. Every part of the meal. There was a Passover lamb that was slain. It had to be clean and spotless. There was blood that would be shed and put over the doorpost. If you didn't do it, then your firstborn would die in your home. All the Egyptians didn't do it, and the firstborn of all those families lost their life that night. It was with great judgment that God came upon the nation of Israel, I mean the nation of Egypt, to set the children of Israel free. But he takes these and refers back to that time all these thousand years of recorded history where the Jews had been taking Passover, Jesus now sits down and basically saying, everything you saw there, everything symbolized there, oh, that's, that's me. He says, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. This, is, this bread, this is my body. Everything was pointing of all those covenant relationships to the ultimate covenant would be made. All that symbolism was all pointing to Jesus Christ. Every covenant, by the way, as you go through Scripture and you see covenants being fulfilled between, between people, they were, they were always confirmed by the shedding of blood with a sacrifice. I mean, when Noah and the Lord were made covenant, when God made covenant with Abraham, Noah and Abraham didn't go out and hire lawyers to draw up a contract. All right? It was drawn up by the Father. He's the one who made the solemn oaths and promises. And the Bible tells us says that the covenants were cut. In other words, there's a sacrifice that was made. The sacrifice kind of symbolized ultimately in those covenants, this is serious business. This is, this is life costing business. This requires total, absolute surrender. This re requires a total and absolute commitment. The Bible says that these covenants were cut. What do you mean they were cut? They were cut. And it was, God was saying in effect of all that, that, there, that blood is going to be spilled and something's going to pay a price. And your sins through this, this cutting are going, to be, are, are, going, are going to be taken care of. Uh, even in the military today, that terminology is used when, when a military clerk uh, cuts an order for something. We, we use it in business today, even that, still that terminology still goes on. Hey, he cut a deal. 
You know, we, that, that, so that kind of idea, but it all goes back to the fact that we, of cutting something, that blood was being shelved, that promises were being made and they were such sacred and high and, and holy promises that it cost life. Well, we know through Jesus Christ, the life that it cost uh, on our behalf was his life, right? He paid the price. He was the one who, who was the spotless lamb of God. He was the one that all those Passover meals symbolized, that, that lamb, that spotless lamb that had to be inspected and, and, and certified, so to say, as being clean and spotless. He was the one who was being depicted by all those lambs that were slain over all those times through the Old Testament. A covenant, a sacrifice, a cutting took place, and blood was shed. I mean, that, the wages of sin is what? So when you look to the cross and people say, well, why did Jesus have to die? Well, he had to die because we're guilty sinners. Someone pays that price. All right? Someone pays that price. There's nothing free. I mean, there's nothing free today. When somebody steals something at the store, somebody's still paying the price for it. It's passed on to other consumers and price hikes and, 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 and cost measures. It's always covered. Someone pays the price. The insurance company may pay the price, but somebody pays the price. Your sin has to be paid for. It will not go unnoticed by God. Every one of us has sinned against God. God, and so all our sins are going to be dealt with. Now, the best and most reliable way to deal with your sins is at the cross where Jesus paid the price, where he was severely crushed, bruised, wounded, and put to death on our behalf. So he pays the price. Now, the way of, in the Old Testament, the way of, of sin being forgiven, and it was just really temporary in nature, and it was really had to be repeated continually, was through the sacrifice of animals that would be given over and over again. Jeremiah put it this way, though. He says, listen, the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, and I will put my law in their hearts, and I will be their God. They will be my people. I'll forgive the wickedness, and I will remember their sin no more. God is telling Jeremiah to tell the people the day is going to come when a sacrifice is going to be made that's going to cover all sin and it's going to be such a miracle thing that I'm literally not going to write the law on tablets of stone. I'm going to write it on your heart. Now we know the new covenant that Jesus makes that is sealed by his blood does that for us. When we come to Christ, give our hearts to him, God does a work within us. We're, we're different people now. We're changed. If any man comes to Christ, he's a new creature. What happens? God writes his law on your heart. Well, what does that mean? You know what God wants is what that means. It's in your heart. You know what the Lord wants. But not only that, I believe it also means that I not only know what God wants, I have a desire to do it. God's given me a desire to do what his will is. And that's when we come back to this table of sacrifice and to the Lord's Supper, we remember that this covenant that Jeremiah mentioned has now been fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. Century later, it's realized in Jesus Christ. It's the new covenant. And God himself provides the offering for the sin that we have committed by giving his only son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest price that could ever be paid in all of Time and all of eternity has been paid by Jesus. It was Martin Luther in his reflection. He said, listen, one drop, one drop of Christ's precious blood is worth more than heaven and earth. Praise God for the precious blood of Jesus that pays for my sins. Now, as I say, these sacrifices in the Old Testament by, by nature were just temporary and they had to be repeated consistently over and over again. Every year, the high priest would have to go into the holy place and the, the lamb's blood would be sprinkled on the holy place and on the altar there. And he'd confess the sins of the nation and the sins of the people. But now, the book of Hebrew tells us something a little bit different. It explains that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is an eternal covenant. In Hebrews chapter 11, it's an eternal covenant which does not need to be repented. It is once and for all. It's a once and for all event. When we observe communion, when we observe the Lord's Supper, we don't reenact, we don't repeat Jesus' sacrifice in any way. We're just symbolizing, remembering it symbolically with the elements that Jesus gave us to remember it by. There's nothing mystical in these elements. They're purely symbolic. But they are given to us by the Lord Jesus himself to take time to remember what he's done. 
One thing you need to remember as you look at all this, when we observe it, it's not a repeat. It's not reenactment. We, we've heard some religious groups say, well, well, the blood actually becomes the blood of Jesus when it's taken in, and the bread becomes the body of Christ, and somehow this sanctified moment takes place. No, praise God, we've been sanctified at the cross when we give our life to Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. But it is important that we do this. And Jesus said, when you do it, remember me. Remember, as we do this today, this, is, this, this new covenant, this relationship we've entered into to God, it is completely unconditional. It's completely undeserved. It is a covenant of, of grace. You don't deserve what Jesus did for you. And anytime you think you do, boy, you're really out of line and your thinking is completely warped. You don't deserve what God has done for us. I don't deserve what God has done for me. I didn't initiate this work of God in my life, and nor did you. He initiated it. He sent his son. That was our message last week. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He did that. We all, all we can do is receive this gift of grace by faith. And even after we've done that, I mean, I can't, I've disappointed the Lord. Amen. Amen. But even when I've disappointed the Lord, praise God, he does not disown me. Nor does he disown you. The sacrifice is eternal. The sacrifice is full. The sacrifice is complete. So everything I'll ever do, every sin I've ever done, past, present, future, it's all under the blood of Jesus. Now, I, I understand the Bible makes it clear that if I want to enjoy that relationship, and I want to express, experience fellowship with God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit in my life, then I need to be, be right with God. I, I don't need to be a Christian who's being a disobedient child. Yeah, I need to, first John says, we need to go to the Father and ask God for forgiveness. And if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and he's just because the sin's been paid for by his son. He's just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise God. This, this, this covenant of God, this, this, this relationship we have through this covenant of God is solemn. It can't be broken. That's why I'm not one of those people who believes you can lose your salvation. And there's a lot of people who believe that. Well, you know, I, I guess I could be bad enough to lose. Well, how bad you got to be? You were a lot worse off when he saved you at the beginning. You, you, the Hebrew says, if it were possible for you to lose it, then Jesus would have to come again and reenact the whole thing one more time. And we know how many disobedient children we, 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 we can gather together, amen? So if Jesus had to be crucified moment, by moment, by moment, by moment. No, his work is complete, and the Bible says it's done once for all time. So the, the glorious thing is that we, we accept what the Lord God has done for us. We, we receive his sacrifice by faith. You know, we set together and we, we demonstrate it by setting together and say, here's what the Lord has done for me. Here's my expression. Here, here's my statement as I'm receiving. Jesus Christ loved me. He came and he, he saved me. And there's something I believe also that even as Jesus sat with those disciples in that upper room, knowing this was the last time they would celebrate this moment together because he's made it very clear to them, he's going to die. He's going to give up his life and he's going to be raised from the dead. But he's telling them, listen, you know, don't grieve. Don't, don't, let not your heart be, be, be heavy and saddened because I'm going to go prepare a place for you that where I am, you can be with me also. And if I, I wouldn't tell you if it were not so. But think about that moment of, and the beauty of that moment when he's sitting with them in communion and he's sitting with them in fellowship and they're sharing this meal together. Today, we sit together as the body of Christ, as the people of God, and we celebrate by remembering what Jesus has done for us. We celebrate by renewing our oaths, our pledges, our commitments to him. We celebrate by leaving here in the spirit of revival. And remembering what the Lord Jesus has, has done for us. I, I don't believe there's ever a time we should receive the Lord's Supper that we're not experiencing some kind of personal revival in our own heart and life. That we're not taking the time, as Paul said in his letter to the Corinthians about the Lord's Supper, we don't take the time to reflect and deal with the things that are hindering our walk with God and our fellowship. And the covenant is, is beautiful, but the, the terms of the covenant were, were pretty simple. In clarity, God makes it clear to us, hey, we're sinners, you know, and we're guilty before God. That's clearly identified throughout scriptures. You can't enter into the covenant with God until you have, you're going to have to agree with that. You're going to have to come to the place and say, yeah, that's me too. I've sinned against God. And come to the place where we said a while ago, I deserve punishment for what I've done. Everybody pays for what they've done. Or Jesus pays on their behalf. You realize at that point that Christ is the substitute. He took my punishment. That should have been me on the cross. I should be the one 
who is dying for my sins. Now, the problem with you paying the price for your sins, you're a dirty sacrifice. You're blemished by sin. Jesus is not blemished by sin. He's a spotless sacrifice. So your sacrifice is not sufficient, even for yourself. That's pretty bad news, isn't it? I got good news. His is not only good enough for you, it's good enough for all of us. He's a spotless Lamb of God. We come to this place, though, where we accept, we receive by faith what the Lord has done for us, that he took our place. We accept the sacrifice that his blood covers, that the covenant covers, that he was cut on our behalf. He shed his blood on our behalf, and we're forgiven on the basis of what he did for us at the cross. If he had not done that, there'd be no hope. And what happens in that moment when we do by faith accept him, then God does something within us. He writes his law upon our heart, and he gives us a desire to do his will. He enables us to live for him. Without Jesus present in your life, you'll never be able to live for Jesus. You'll never be able to live for God. Your life will never come to a place to make sense on any level. But when you come to Christ, it's done. And the bread and the cup that Jesus takes off this table, they are just signs of the new covenant. They point to the reality of our Savior. Jesus isn't talking about the cup itself, but he's talking about what the cup contains and what, that, what it contains and what it represents. This cup is the covenant of the covenant. It contains, symbolically, my blood, and you're going to have to receive it. That's where faith comes in. All through Scripture, eating and drinking is referred to as an act of faith an act of commitment. He said, eat my flesh, drink my blood. He's not talking about cannibalism. He's talking about receive his life. Commit your life to him. He said, and often as you do this, what do we do? Two words, remember me. And I think the point of remembering, if you look at this particular word in Scripture, it means that you're going to put everything else out of your mind this morning when you do this. You're going to focus everything on Jesus. Not remembering you, remembering him. Now, remember what you're dealing with, remembering him. Now, remember what we may be facing tomorrow, the trials and struggles of last week. No, remember Jesus. There's something I believe that happens in the child of God when they just begin to focus their eyes upon Christ. Remember the old song, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So today, as we receive this meal together, turn your eyes on Jesus. You have to lift them up, and you have to look beyond yourself, and you realize that in turning your eyes upon Jesus, he's what it's really all about. I remember, what, 15, 20 years ago when those uh, Indiana Jones movie came out in search of the cup of the Holy Grail or whatever it was. And the idea that if they found the Holy Grail, which was the cup that Jesus, the chalice that he drank from, you know, there was this silver chalice. I, I, who knows? It's probably a wooden mug in reality. But if you drank from this silver chalice, then you would have eternal life. You would never die physically even. And uh, it was a disaster for all who sought to do so. It's always a disaster when you think that something other than Jesus is going to give you life. There's a lot of people looking in long directions. If I just could get to this place, or if I could just have this, or if God would just do that for me, or if this would happen, that's not where life is. You're going to have to face it. And if everything you're going through is to show you that life's going to be found only in Jesus first and foremost, then God may it be so. But it's not a cup. It's not a, it may have some archaeological value, but it has no spiritual value. All the value is found in the one who said, remember me. And so as we receive this meal together today, say, this is about you, Jesus. The cup doesn't save me. The bread doesn't save me. But the blood of Jesus and the body of Jesus is my only hope and my only salvation. And in doing that, I believe one thing that really happens at that point in our heart and life is there's a renewal takes place. A revival should take place. That's why Paul wrote the church at Corinthians, his first letter, and he said in chapter 11, so when you take this meal together, he said, examine yourself. About what? Make sure you're on, your eyes are on Jesus. Make sure you're remembering Christ. 
He said, examine yourself to the point you see if there's any division in the body of Christ. There's any relationship that's not right between you and somebody. There's something you can take care of and hadn't taken care of. There's some sin in your heart and your life that you've been holding on to and God's told you to get rid of it. You're still embracing it. Deal with it today. And if we do that and we examine ourselves and we put Jesus in his rightful place as the Lord of our heart and our life, that's when God does great things in our life. So I'm going to ask you, why don't we just stand for a moment before we receive the communion together. Perhaps you have something.